You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wise, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have John Douglas on the show with me today. He has an amazing new book. It's called The Killer Shadow, The FBI's Hunt for a White Supremacist Serial Killer. And uh, I'll tell you what, John, this uh, I, I have uh, a pre-release art copy of the book, and this thing, it, it looks like it's been through the ringer because... You know, I, I'm reading it and I find myself bending the, you know, like <laughs> white knuckling the book as I go, um, which I think is a great sign. I I, I hope it is. Yeah. You, you know, um, I uh, I hate to molest books, but uh, I think that's a I think you'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I know you as that kind of guy. Um, yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Hank. Thanks for having me. Uh, John, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I, well, I believe, actually, in the, uh, I was already in the, in the FBI working, uh, you know, such interesting cases. And then when I started to uh, conduct uh, interviews of uh, various uh, serial killers, assassin personalities, rapists, I thought, man, this would be great and uh one day to write a book uh about those early experiences which i would end up doing it would be in the book mind hunter uh would be the uh the first the, the very first one and um but I, I was a storyteller as an instructor for the uh, when i was a teacher at the fbi academy but i really needed uh somebody you know like you hank to put it together for me so i had mark olshaker who came to uh, Quantico to do a, a, a show for Nova Television inside the, the mind of a serial killer. And, and he spent several months with me, and I was getting close to retirement, and I mentioned to him, I said, what do you think about, uh, uh, you know, is there a book in me? And, and he said, geez, he said, I, I think so. Let's go to New York. So I went to New York and, and uh, went around to the publishing houses, and there were so many publishing houses that were, were interested in me uh, joining them. In fact, some of them would put books on the table in front of me where other authors wrote stories about the cases that I personally uh, personally worked. And so uh, so then we uh, we went with uh, Simon Schuster uh, and uh, they gave us a, a it was initially a single book uh, contract. Uh, there was a bidding war uh, be between them and Pocket Books within the same company because Pocket Books wanted the book as well. So they decided with internally to to uh, Pocket Books to do uh, the paperback uh, version a year later when when that uh, would uh, would come out. So this one book, I thought it'd be a one book wonder, and that one book became a New York Times uh, bestseller, the number uh, number one New York Times bestseller. Then they offered a five book deal, but the writing the writing with me. Uh, I'll rough out uh, the case, the cases that we uh, that we want to write about, or I'll I'll uh, we'll meet together and we'll take the uh, the cases, and then Mark will will write it, and then I'll go over go over what he's written and make sure it's correct and and uh, is using the right terminology. But uh, I'm not going to kid you. I, I I always tell him. I say I say Mark. Uh, you're not a profiler, so I won't. I won't make believe that I'm this great, great writer. As long as you don't make believe you're just some <laughs> profiler, because every once in a while he'll say we'll be talking about a case like John Benny Ramsey case, and he's and he'll say we. I'll say yeah, like we did this, or and I'll say Mark we. I said I don't remember you sitting next to me when I had to go before the grand jury in Boulder, Colorado, <laughs> where where four pro prosecutors were were drilling me, uh, you know, one after another about the analysis I did. And then I had to answer questions by the grand, the grand jury. You know, so, uh, and, and Mark is a writer. He's, he's developed uh, I, uh, over the, the years too. He's, I mean, he, he, he's 
he could probably profile a case. I won't tell him that personally, but I could probably give him a case. He, he's been with me like 20 years now, so he would he'd probably do a pretty good job. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> <laughs> So you you wound up in the FBI. We're, we're just going to backtrack for just a minute so sure. that we can kind of give the the listeners an idea of the trajectory that you've been on. Um, you uh, you were a cop uh, and uh, a, a SWAT cop at one point, and then you wind up at the FBI. Um, what was it that led you to the FBI? And was there some um, kind of overwhelming or overarching purpose? That, that this was uh, a place that you wanted to be and a goal you were striving for. Okay. Well, actually, well, you said a little out of order here. I was oh, in, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was in the United States Air Force. I was an enlisted guy and then uh, went to graduate school, uh, undergraduate school. I was the first airman to get an undergraduate degree in a really short uh, period of time. And I wanted to be, uh, at one point early in my life, I wanted to be a veterinarian. But now at this point, now in the in the Air Force, I, I wanted to be some type of a, a psychologist, maybe a clinical or industrial psychologist. They called it back, you know, back then. But I was poor. I was living in in a in a, a cellar, basically, just got out of the service on, on the GI Bill, and I was working out at this gym, real crummy kind of a looking gym, the only gym in town in Clovis, New Mexico. And I was always nice to people and, and treated people uh, people well. I did a lot of volunteer work with special needs children, and this. Uh, this man approached me one day and he said, John, I see, you, know, you don't know, but I'm an FBI agent. You've been talking to an FBI agent this, this whole period of time. I said, oh, really? I said, how would you like to go to the FBI? And I said, I really don't know that much, uh, much about it. Uh, so he took me home to his head. He had a nice house. I, I'm coming out of a cellar to look at a, at a nice house. He shows me his green government check, uh, which looks pretty good compared to my <laughs> measly uh, GI bill, <laughs> bill check. And uh, the next thing I, you know, I, I sign the, the paperwork um, and I go to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I take a series of tests. And at 25 years of age, I'm going to be one of the youngest FBI agents uh, to be uh, to be uh, sent back to Washington to go through training with uh, with 25 years of age, with four years of military experience. And so uh, after that, uh, going through the, the the 14 weeks of training, I was assigned to Detroit, Michigan, and uh, in about 1971, 72, and and then I started thinking about the criminal mind, the criminal personality, uh, particularly on it was Super Bowl Sunday, in 1972, and we were going to make uh, in Detroit alone, we were going to make about uh, 300 arrests of, of gamblers, bookies, which today the bureaus. But it doesn't really play much of a role in those kind of cases anymore with legalized gambling. But back then it was organized crime related. And to make all that this long story short, one of the guys I arrested, I, I, I have in the back seat. And I always wanted, I always ask questions like if I have a bank robber, why this bank? Why did you pick this bank? Why this day? Why, why this time? With this guy, I said, I remember his first name only is Frank. I said, Frank. I said, why are you doing this? I mean, every year the FBI, it, it, uh, we're invest, investigating you, arresting you, the state police, the local police. And he, he looks at me and he was like, in an, uh, here I'm now about 26. And he's now at, at, at about mid 30s. And he says, man, he says, you don't get it, kid. I said, what are you talking about? And I had him handcuffed in front. Uh, his hands were in front of him on his lap. And I'm sitting next to him, another agent's driving the car. And it was raining. And he looks over at the, this pane of glass and he says, do you see those two raindrops over here? And, yeah, what about them? He says, I bet you that the one on the left gets down to the bottom of the pane of glass before the one on the right. And I said, okay, let's let's go. I'll, I'll bet you. Well, he wins. He wins his uh, the, the race and, uh, with the raindrops. And he looks at me and says, you understand what I'm talking about, kid? I said, what? You just beat me in a raindrop race. And he said, man, he says, you're, you're a young man. You don't, you don't get it. He says, what, what I'm trying to teach you is that we don't need a Super Bowl. We don't need any big kind of game. All we need are two raindrops. We are who we are. And you're not going to stop us. You're not going to stop me, the FBI, the, the state police, local police. And I, I took that. And it was so interesting. And so when I finally go to my next assignment, in Milwaukee, I be, that's where I become a SWAT team member, a hostage negotiator. I pick up a couple of advanced degrees. I then am 
uh, sent back to the FBI Academy now as the youngest, the youngest, not only the youngest instructor at the FBI Academy, but one of the youngest supervisors of, of all in Washington, D.C. and Quantico, where there's a thousand supervisors in, in, uh, in D.C. And it kind of follows a little bit like uh, your listeners who watched, uh, if they watched Netflix Mindhunter, it, it, uh, you know, I'm thrown into a class uh, to teach criminal psychology. And, and while I'm auditing these classes, I see that students who are police officers and seasoned police officers from all over the world, and, and here's an instructor presenting a case, say that it's Charles Manson case, presents a case, all of a sudden a hand goes up in, in the classroom and, and it, one of the students will say, hey, look, I worked that case, so-and-so. You got your facts wrong. Your facts are totally wrong. So I'm sitting in the back saying, oh, my goodness, ha, I have to get up there one day. I, I'm listening to an instructor in the FBI. He doesn't even know the facts of the case. So as a means of survival, what I, I did and, and how I got to where uh, I would end today and, and how I became this, kind of like the... the uh, uh, the, the father of profiling for the FBI was I wanted primarily to to do the interviews to make me a good instructor, and so that's why I went out and interview what like Edmund Kemper, six foot nine, three hundred pounds, kills a series of coeds, kills his mother or his neighbor, and interviewing him, interviewing uh, Charles Manson, get a lot of information. Now, now I'm back into the into the classroom and. I would ask a student, did anybody here work, uh, say, the Manson case? And Ann would go up. I said, well, let me tell you something about Manson. You probably never had an, an opportunity to ask him the questions that, that I asked him. You see, I had an opportunity. I spent hours with him in prison. So here I am as this very, very young instructor now at the FBI, uh, getting this reputation. People are trying to hold me back because I'm, um, they want us to remain faceless, but I'm developing this, this new concept. Cops now want to be in my class. Cops now are bringing cases with them to Quantico. And now I'm analyzing these cases. And then informally, and then here comes Dr. Ann Burgess from Boston College, uh, who uh, a professor up there, psychiatric nurse, who will get with me and my, and my uh, FBI partner. And together, we will put together a, an instrument now, a, a, uh, an interview protocol to go into these prisons, conduct these interviews, and, and publish academically, which, which we did uh, do. So that's a real long answer to your question, Hank, but that's, that's kind of the background you know, of it. Uh, 1979, I did 49 cases. By the time I left the Bureau, me and my colleagues now, my unit had grown, I became the unit chief. We were doing over a thousand cases a year from throughout the world. And the FBI was really the last ones to embrace me, was the last ones. And this and this case that I, I'm writing about, and it's Joseph Paul Franklin, would be one of the one of the very first cases. In fact, the first case that I did for the FBI, only because the head of the Civil Rights Division was an agent who together we were on the same SWAT team in the Milwaukee division. And he said, Hey John. I know you're doing all this research, serial murder research uh, down there. Now we have a serial killer, but uh, he's a little different. Do you think you think uh, you can uh, can help us out? And I said, really? I said, I, I don't know. I, I'm just getting started in this stuff. I'll give it a shot. Because uh, he said, we don't know where he is. We've identified him, but we don't know where he is in the United States. So that's when I got I got onto the case. This the uh, that first book, Mind Hunter, uh, went on to inspire the the Netflix uh, TV program, Mind Hunter, um, which is a, a bit of a fictionalized uh, in uh, account of your book, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, what what may surprise a lot of people, and I know it did me. I, I was a little late to the Mind Hunter party, um, <laughs> but what surprised me um, was that. The the information that you were bringing in the the uh, the investigative techniques that you were using um, were so foreign, uh, and it, it seems that that uh, that people didn't know what to make it. You know, in the beginning of your way of thinking or the, your way right. of reasoning and and trying to get inside the mind. Well, I think uh, the question a lot of people have 
maybe um, was was it um, why why do you think we have this rash of of uh, violent crime and serial crime in the in our recent history? And by recent, I mean the last fifty years or so. Um, is is something happening to society, or is something changing in our police work, which makes us more aware of it? Uh, it, it may be a bit of a chicken and an egg thing, but what, what yeah, are- that's a good question because it, it is it is a mix. Uh, first of all, in the in, in the early days when I, I was doing this, now in the seventies and eighties, uh, there wasn't a very good communication between the law enforcement agencies at all, uh, and uh, we had over seventeen thousand different law enforcement agencies in the United States, and uh, even to this day, there are times when a particular police department in one county may not be aware of, of a, a case. Say, say they have a homicide, they're not aware that there's a similar homicide in an adjoining uh, county. Uh, so you had that problem. And, and as a serial killer, uh, you, could, you could get away with it a lot easier than, than you can today. Today, there's a bet, there is a better uh, uh, union between the different Agencies have learned a lot. We, we've taught them a lot at the FBI, at the FBI you know, Academy, work in these cases, t- taking a look at them, uh, at the case from a behavioral perspective. But one of the things, too, is, and it, it is the, what we see with the people that we interviewed, whether they were serial rapists, assassins, serial arsonists, uh, there was dysfunction in the families where they, uh, where they came from. Uh, they were there was abuse going on. There was some form of neglect, psychological or emotional, uh, sexual abuse with with this particular person. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person will grow up to be a violent, a violent criminal. Because when you take a look at Joseph Paul Franklin, there were other he had uh, siblings there that did not grow up to be a serial killer, you know, like uh, you know, like he did. So. So you have you have that now. We're able to through DNA, the development of DNA, we're able to cut off some of the careers of the these uh, the offenders a lot uh, a lot sooner. But uh, people that talk uh, to ask me sometimes. I said, how many serial killers are there in the United States? And I've always said, going back into the when I first started, at least between thirty five and fifty uh, serial killers. And by definition, that's a person who. By my definition, the Bureau has modified it. It's someone who kills three or more people over a period of time. Uh, and uh, we, we used to refer to it as a cooling off period. The Bureau now has lopped off a case, so now it's two, two uh, or more, or more uh, cases. Uh, and, uh, and that would be the definition of it. 35 to 50. But you get Radford University and some organizations. There's one up in, uh, up in Northern Virginia. Uh, where they track unsolved homicides, they have said that the estimates could be close to uh, serial killers in the United in the United States. Uh, and, and you see, it, as long as long as you have uh, populations where where you have vulnerable victims, uh, easy victims uh, for uh, for these offenders, they could be women or men who may be prostituting. Uh, it could be runaways, so-called throwaways. It could be uh, homeless people. It could be uh, drug, uh, uh, drug addicts. These are the, these are easy pickings for someone so inclined to kill. And what, what makes it difficult is what we would call victimology. It's one thing when you do a, a profile of a victim, say a housewife who's murdered in a house. You do a, a background. We call it victimology. But when you're talking about, say, some a a, a prostitute, for example, who comes in contact with various johns it's going to be extremely difficult uh you know to come up with the 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 unsub the unknown unknown uh, subject or you get a a runaway a runaway who's coming in contact with different different people it's it's, it it makes it really difficult for uh for law enforcement uh the easy crimes are the domestic homicides the the one the cases where the 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 offender and the victim they know each other uh, but the other types of cases, we refer to it as uh, crimes w- without without a, a motive. Don't appear to be uh, a, 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 like a motive. Uh, of course, there's a motive in the mind of the offender, but
but but there appears to be no apparent motive why this person was targeted to be killed. Maybe the way this person was killed by the by the uh, the uh, you know by the subject. But uh, the cases the cases are are still out there, and and they're all over the world. I track cases from all over all over the world. I mean, uh, we don't have the corner of the market, and we have a very large population, three hundred. 50 million people or so, you almost, you almost are expecting to find, uh, you know, cases like these. But the police, as I said, they're getting, they're getting better equipped in investigating these types of homicides. A hitman with a conscience. Ian Bragg is paid to kill people. Only bad people and not many, but for a great deal of money. Case the target. Make the hit. Move on until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything. A few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg. Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator. The taut, lean prose and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The Operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of The Crime Beat and Alex Vane Media Thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says, Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com John, you have been involved uh, with some of the highest profile cases in our pop culture collective imagination over the last several decades. Um, you mentioned earlier the John Benet Ramsey case that I think that's a, a case that most everyone is familiar with, at least on the surface. Um, what was your involvement with that case? I was, I, I happened to be at the time, I was, I was at teaching in, in Utah when I got a call from the defense team. And I, up to that point, I was following the case like everyone else in the newspapers and on television. I, I'm thinking, man, these, these people are guilty. So the defense team calls me to to provide the assistance to them and so i go there but i'm 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 ready for them i'm i uh, I, I go to this law firm I dig it's a mansion in, in bold uh, this was in denver actually initially where the law firm was and i go inside and i go inside a plexiglass room uh inside of another room so no one can hear anything that's being said in this in this, uh, in this, uh, like $64,000 question room, you know, it's real <laughs> secret. And so I'm waiting for these guys who are going to try to throw money at me and I'm going to walk out of there. I'm, I'm going to leave. And, and they say, John, he said, look, he said, we don't know. He said, we don't think that the Ramses are, are responsible, but, but really, we are really interested in you to analyze this case and present whatever you find, you find it. 
you know, you, uh, you, you know, tell us whatever you think. I said, what do you need? So I told him the kind of information that I needed to do the analysis. I'd like to go to the, uh, the crime scene itself, which I, I, you know, I did, I did that, you know, as well. Uh, I then got to interview the Ramseys and, uh, and John Ramsey, uh, broke him down during, during the, uh, my talk with him. Uh, he lost a, another daughter almost to the day, several years earlier, uh, his oldest daughter just got engaged and was with her fiance in Chicago, going to meet his parents when they get an automobile accident, uh, snow and ice, and both of them are killed. And he breaks down. He breaks down on, on that. But interview, interview him, interview the uh, Patsy, and I, I come to the conclusion based upon the crime that, that this parents kill. Believe me, parents do kill, but they don't kill like the, the way this child w- was killed. Uh, and I, I, I've been real uh, adamant about it. people have criticized me, but I had cops sending me emails and pe- people. You were wrong about this, or I had respect for you, but you got this all wrong. I said, "What?" And I'm thinking, "What the hell do you know?" I, I mean, <laughs> you, you're sitting somewhere in an armchair. You haven't even been there. You haven't even looked. You know, looked at the case. Uh, you know, you're just basing this on stuff you're hearing through the media and what the the cops, uh, you know, you know, are saying here. Well, the police department works one homicide a year, if that. Some years they don't have any, and, and the one previous to that that they had, they didn't solve that one, you know, either. And so parents kill, but the, the actions of the parents that I, that I saw uh, at, at that day, what would happen? It was and it was John Ramsey who would find his daughter, and the police were at that house for hours and hours, uh, uh, and never searched the the basement. And it wasn't until one of the detectives told Ramsey, he "Say, make yourself busy. Go with your neighbor here, Fleet White, and uh, see what see if you see anything, uh, you know, unusual." So. They go down the basement. Now, if John Ramsey, if what I've seen from other cases, if he was a killer, he would have told Fleet White, his neighbor, Fleet, you go over here, search over here, and I'll search over on this side in the basement here. No, it was John Ramsey goes into this so-called wine cellar. They don't even drink, uh, but they had this wine cellar and finds his, his daughter with duct tape on, on her mouth, her hands uh, tape uh, over her over her head. And he, and oh my God, my baby, he yells. He removes the duct tape. And then now by him removing the duct tape, it, it, first it, it messes up evidence. But people are saying, well, he moved, removed the duct tape because he put the duct tape on. So he wants to obliterate uh, you know, his fingerprints. Uh, you know, no, if, if, I, if, if I find my daughter in that condition, the first thing I'm going to do is remove the duct tape and, and see if she's alive. And, and so he removes the tape picks up her body, which is in rigor. She's been down there for several hours, carries her up upstairs into the, into the living room. And uh, uh, the whole scene is, is totally con- uh, contaminated. You have ministers there. They're trying to rub the body, uh, trying to bring the child back, uh, you know, back uh, to life. And they don't even notice and because the, uh, that she has been garroted. And the garrot is so tight in her neck, you can't even, you can't even see it. And and you see a very slight bruise on her forehead, on one side of her forehead. And it's not until you do the autopsy, you see that, that and you remove the, the skin from the head, you see that her skull it looks like a coconut that's been cracked, an eight inch, eight inch fracture on, 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 her, on her skull. Now, why was there not bruising on her head, on her, a swollen, being a, uh, some swelling? And bruising, why? I mean, look at this. Look what this blunt force instrument did to her head is because she was she was on her either her last breath or she has already her heart stopped beating and she was dead. When this perpetrator still had this anger inside of him that that he wasn't finished with perpetrating this crime, so he strikes her, strikes her, you know, in the head like the the final the final uh, blow to her. And so there were just so many different different things there, and and uh, my colleagues at the bureau too they wouldn't they wouldn't speak to me. Uh, they think they, they, they've changed their mind over the over the years, but they were angry like I'm I'm I'm, I'm helping the defense here. You know, they're 
I'm thwarting their investigation. No, I'm not helping defense. If, if I felt that family was responsible, I I I, I would uh, I would have went barrel into that investigation. Everything I got, I tried to get a confession out, out of Ramsey, but he didn't do it, and Patsy didn't uh, do it. And, I, and I, it drives me crazy when I see these people. Oh, look at his nonverbals, and look at Patsy Ramsey. She has when they brought up. Uh, 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 John Bonet from the cellar. She was sitting on a chair, looking through her fingers. Were her fingers were splayed in, in, across her eyes, looking, peering through that. Uh, it's the signs that she was responsible for the murder. That's a bunch of BS. Uh, you know. So <laughs> here, you not only not only did you falsely, uh, uh, you 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 have a family here who lost their their daughter, but now you falsely accuse them of killing uh, their daughter and rake them over the the coal. And Mrs. Ramsey, with her cancer that she had, was uh, she was in remission at the time. The cancer, her cancer would uh, come back, and of course they were all looking for the dying declaration. She's going to confess. That's not confession. She didn't do it. You know, she didn't do it at all. And John Ramsey lost a fortune, and it drove me, it got me really angry when I saw CBS do this special, and they were sued. They were sued uh, uh, by an attorney representing the Ramseys, Lynn Wood. Uh, uh, from Atlanta, who did the Richard Jewell case uh, as well in the Atlantic uh, bombing case, sued him. Where CBS gets on there and FBI agents, retired agents, and it's a group and and forensic pathologists and and well known people in this country were on that panel and on, in this investigation, and they accused Burke Ramsey. But Ramsey, the son, was responsible for the murder. Well, they were sued. No one knows what how much they had to pay. But CBS was sued. The people involved in that were. Uh, you know, were, were sued. And it just further just destroyed, further destroyed the lives of even Burke, you know, Burke Ramsey, who's, you know, now he's like 32 years of age. And, uh, you know, and he didn't kill. Him. He was he was nine years old, eight, eight or nine years old. He did not kill his his sister at that time. So it's a, it just drives me kind of crazy. And these armchair investigators, you know, out there, you know, it's, it's great they have they have some of the shows where they can go over cases, but sometimes you, you actually can jeopardize an investigation and, 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 uh, uh, by the, and by what's being said about the cases, you know, th- through these these chat rooms. So. Well, from uh, Sir Arthur uh, Conan Doyle to Agatha Christie and now up to um, uh, psychological thrillers like Gone Girl and, uh, you know, the, the others that have had these huge uh, sort of um, cultural references. Um, we as a people seem to be really obsessed with with crime fiction and true crime. And uh, uh, first off, what do you think of the public's obsession with these types of stories? Do you think it's a it's a healthy thing or it, it, and do you think that uh, you know, you know, what what are we as a population getting out of being more informed about this type of thing? And, and you know, what do you think about it? Which I, what it is, and I, I do a lot of public speaking and and or I did before the pandemic, I haven't done anything. Sure. But we, we uh, uh, when I do speak at these crime conferences, too, sometimes uh, the, the audience is pretty much, I'd say, 80, 90 percent are, are female in the in the audience. So who are more times than not, the kind of cases that I've worked are the victims of these uh, crimes. And and uh, what I've always said was, well, like a, a simple formula is why plus how equals who. And 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 so um, you're looking at just why why this victim why did these things happen to uh, to the victim uh, the way the victim you know was killed and how was it how was it done what, is there one is multiple crime scenes and and. Let's do an analysis of the victim, a detailed analysis to figure out, you know, the, the who done it. So it, 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 everyone's it, it's, it's of interest to know. Uh, and, and just like this, Joseph Paul Franklin will be the same thing in this book. I mean, can you detect someone who has this potential? You know, certainly this potential for, uh, you know, for violence. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you, you can predict. School teachers can predict. Uh, my wife is still a school teacher. Teaching uh, for 49th year of school teaching, she's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so you'll have teachers come up to you and say, "You're describing characteristics that I see now with uh, with a child in my class who's from a very dysfunctional family. 
He's, he's involved in animal cruelty. Uh, he's involved in setting fires. He's a bully, you know. And so people are interested in, in and, and women are interested for their own protection um, of uh, when they meet somebody. You have all these dating sites uh, nowadays. Uh, I remember my mother, too. And she, my mother was right uh, when she told my sister, she said, if you want to know about uh, the man you, you, uh, that you say you're dating, uh, and if he's the right one for you, ask him what his relationship is with his mother. And my, that was, a, my mother was, was smart. She didn't realize, and I didn't realize it at the time, but, but she's ex- exactly right because of the people who I've interviewed, it's, it's more times than not, it, it's a, a mother thing. The father, passive, absent in many cases, but it's, it's, a, a, it's a mother thing with, with so many of them. Uh, from Mind Hunters, the uh, the book, and also yeah, you know, from uh, uh, the TV show uh, Edmund Kemper. I mean, Ed, Edmund Kemper, he was mistreated by his mother, kept locked up in, in the basement where he'd fantasize, you know, that he was uh, killing killing women. He would take his sister's dolls and cut the heads off, cut the arms and legs off. Things he did with the dolls that he would later do, you know, with the uh, you know with uh, people. At 15 years of age, he acts out. He kills his grandparents. They put him in a mental institution. They cure him, supposedly, and they let him out. Who do they put him with? The mother, the one who was abusive uh, to him throughout his life. And he and uh, mother's preaching to him that you're nothing, you're no good, nobody. He, uh, and his mother worked at the university in Santa, Santa Cruz, California, and said, there's girl, pretty girls there. You'll never be able to have one of those girls because you're nothing. You're nobody. You're just like your, your old man was, uh, she was divorced from her, her uh, husband, hated her husband. And, and Ed reminded her of her husband. So he got back at mom by going out and uh, abducting those co- college co and doing things to them that he did to the dolls. And finally, the last chapter in, the, in, the, in his story was he will end up by, you know, killing his uh, mother. Uh, decapitating her and doing unheard of things to her, and then a neighbor came over, kills the neighbor, you know, as uh, you know, you know, as well. So people are interested in, in what creates these people, but it's it starts at a very very early age. Uh, and, and again, it's not to say that everyone's going to, who's abused or neglected is going to turn out to be uh, be a violent, you know, anything. But boy, it's going to be tough on that child uh, unless that child can find. Maybe someone who gives them love, or a school teacher, uh, or another fam, another family member. It's going to be really, really tough, and they they may turn inward too. Females generally will, rather than aggress, will turn inward and and become self destructive. More to turning to prostitution, to alcohol, alcohol, and to drugs, and and eventually, you know, suicide. And males, some males will do that, you know, as well. We see the ones who commit the crimes. They decide to aggress, to, to go out, to, to become a somebody. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, just finds out when he's late in life that he was adopted. And, and his parents never told him uh, about, about that. And then he tracks down his real mother on Long Island and uh, knocks on the door where uh, the mother comes to the door. And his sister, his biological sister, the mother kept. His mother kept the sister, but didn't keep him. And uh, that was the that was the kind of the birth, the coming out of David Burke was the son of Sam. Uh, and from then that point forward, he ends up uh, going out and, and starts killing killing couples, primarily in the New York City uh, area. John, um, it, in the new book, The Killer Shadow. Um, First, I, I, I want to talk ab- uh, all about the story in just a minute. But one thing that strikes me about this book and and some of your other work uh, that I've read is your um, ability to retain your humanity throughout all of this. And, uh, I, you know, as someone that your day job includes uh, hunting and 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 going through evidence and going through reports of just some of the most horrific uh things you know that that we could ever imagine and when we were talking about crime fiction and stuff like that a minute ago but you're talking about real life thing you're you're talking about a lot of times threats that are still out there um how do you deal with that and then go home and still be 
a husband yeah. and father and, you know, and retain your humanity. That has to be the biggest challenge of all. It's, it's, it, it, and, I, and I haven't always been successful, you know, you know, at that at all, uh, because what will happen uh, to me is that and I didn't know when I started this, but then you start the, the stuff that you see day in and day out. And then I, I have to like I used to say, walk in the shoes of the subject and the victim. I try to understand what the interaction between the two, what, however this victim was assaulted and, and what was happening uh, between the victim and, and the, the offender. So I have difficulty. Uh, I, would, I would dream about it, purposely dream about it cases so I can come up with some, you know, some ideas. However, um, there were, when the cases started to come in, it was, it was just, uh, uh, it was just the nature of the cases and then the volume of the cases. And then you're, you're like on call, like all the time. And, and Hank, we didn't have uh, computers uh, at all. So a cop would call me up and say, Hey John, remember uh, we spoke to you two years ago or a year ago, and we got this guy here. We made, got it's the, uh, the profile analysis that he did. And I said, "Wait a minute!" And I said, "Just, just this, please, just describe the crime scene for me, the overall crime, so I can refresh my memory." So I would do it, and then it would come back. It would come back to me. But then what began to happen, and and uh, my not to show took this, but they went way too far with it. Uh, so far with. Uh, with Holden Ford, the, the character who's portraying, who's portraying me, because I'm not really that kind of person, uh, personality. Uh, I, I was a lot, I mean, I, I accomplished a, a lot by the time I got back to Quantico and, 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 and pretty much had my act together and was getting stronger in the, in the, in the work that, that, uh, that I was doing. But I noticed uh, I was exercising to the point of uh, exhaustion to try to c cope with stress. I would come home, drive home the long way uh, just to kind of uh, decompress. And then when I got home, uh, uh, I, I would have three children. And, and but this most was 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 getting to me when I had the two children, two girls, two young girls. And uh, and I would get home and I would go into a room and have a drink and decompress there. But then what what happened? And uh, and this this was you got the Joseph Paul Franklin case. This book here. Uh, I'm also working at the same time. They called me on a case up in uh, New York called the Buff, the 22 caliber killer. We sort of had that going on. Another civil rights case was we had another guy who's killing blacks who were cutting the hearts out of uh, uh, two taxi cab drivers. So I got that going going on there. I have the Tylenol murder case, the Unabomber case, and then the Atlanta child killing uh, uh, case. And, and now, and plus cases you never even heard of, heard of before. And all of a sudden, now I'm up in New York City, given a, a talk to a couple hundred cops, and and uh, it was a frightening experience because I'm, I'm speaking to these police, and I'm thinking of all the the case I have to have to. I just came back from a big trip. And I have to go out to Seattle on the Green River murder case, and I got to do other things. And my mouth is moving. I'm talking. But I'm also getting experience where I think I'm having a heart attack, and and I, I break out in a sweat. My heart is pounding, and I'm saying to myself, hey, "John, you know, regroup, man, regroup. You know, get, get you get back." And and no one, I, I'm sure, no one noticed anything in the in the audience at, at all because I was able to regroup. But I knew something was going to to happen to me, and and sure enough, I I go back to Quantico. I'm going to die here early in, in life. And I don't know why, but I took out income protection. I took out life ins extra life insurance. I go out on the, on the Green River murder case. I bring two agents that I'm trying to train in this, this area here. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm getting tremendous headache on my right temporal lobe. I say, in fact, I said goodbye to my wife two times that day. Once at home and one, I drove to school to say goodbye because I thought I, I wasn't coming back. And so I, I tell the agents, okay, tomorrow I'm not going out. It's Tuesday. You go, you go be with the task force. This is what you do. I'll see you Friday. We go back to DC. Friday uh, rolls around. There's a, 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 a there's no response from me. They knock on my door. No response. They end up kicking down the door. And what they do is they find me in a coma. Uh, my heartbeat is 220. My 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 uh, 
Uh, body temperature was between 104 to 107. My brain had split in the right side of my brain uh, and causing paralysis. And they said, every, uh, the agent said every couple of minutes, the whole body would start, start shaking. And so I, I remained in a, in a coma for a week, came out of it paraly paralyzed, partially paralyzed on my, one, one side, my left side, because my right side was bleeding. And uh, was in a hospital a month. Came back, went to a psychologist and a psychiatrist, for, uh, and they tested me and they said, John, you're burning the candle at both ends. He said, What you got? And, you, and, and I went to University of Virginia Medical School and brought me. I had viral encephalitis, and, uh, but they say my immune system was just so low that, uh, you know, if it wasn't that, they said, John, it would have been like something else, you know, cancer, or you could have got a heart attack. So, question. It's very, very difficult. It's it's difficult to 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 work this you know, work this kind of work. You wouldn't believe how many letters I get from young children, even who young and, and high school kids uh, that want to do this. They want to do this one day, and they they really don't understand. It's it's a lot different than uh, television and what you're watching on television. You can't get it through watching Criminal Minds, for example. Too, uh, it's not. Uh, my mentor was close to, to it and, uh, and of the way things were, were done, uh, more so than criminal minds, because uh, in criminal minds, these, the agents are going out and they're kicking down doors and making arrests. Uh, in reality, you, you become a, a coach. You're, you're coaching. You're coaching others. You can't be, you can't be, be testifying or, uh, or conducting interrogations of, of all the these cases, you'll be you'll be in court all the time. So you you coach you coach you, you coach an investigator and you tell them how to, your idea of how the case should be worked and maybe if they get a suspect, who should do the interview. I may even tell them you, you did a great job and you're not really the best person to interview this person that you d develop here. So, uh, but it's it's uh, it, everyone's fascinated by it, but it's it's hazardous to your health. And, and and other agents in my unit, a lot of them died already, and younger, younger than than me. And it made me a good supervisor because I could see burnout among my agents, men and women, because they're just really dedicated, dedicated to. And I would tell them, go home, just go home. And bureau doesn't like that because everything is so rigid. And I said, I'll cover for you. Don't worry, I'll sign you out. We have to sign in and out. I'll sign you out. And they here's the agent wants to take work home with them. no don't take work just go home and just just uh you know unwind rest have a drink do whatever go to have a sauna uh so it's it's difficult but it's, it takes about five years to learn this but like any job really any job it takes about five i think five years and but within this job by five years you're right on the verge of getting burned out <laughs> and of my 25 years i did it for eight 18 of my 25 uh years but my my unit that I had and the people uh, in that unit back then, I think they're even better than what they have today because uh, we were everything, every kind of case. And everyone had 50 cases at a time uh, and uh, they were they were really top notch. Today, the bureau uh, is broken down into different subunits working like maybe just child abductions or one unit, just serial murders. Now, we, we did arson and bombing. We, we did uh, uh, all kinds of. Secret Service. You would have thought Secret Service had a unit like this. No, I did cases for Secret Service, and then they sent an agent with me who we ended up doing assassination research, and we interviewed Franklin. Uh, it was one of the ones, Joseph Paul uh, Franklin. ATF didn't have a unit uh, devoted to this, so we trained the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and, and trained some great, uh, you know, great, uh, you know, people. But it's 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 stressful. Very very uh, very stressful. One of those cases that uh, that was stressful and that that uh, hung with you for a long time uh, would be the case that we're talking about in the Killer Shadow, the the brand new book, um, yeah. the FBI's hunt for a white supremacist serial killer in in, uh, in in a line of work where you're you're trying to drill down and find motivations, a white supremacist serial killer. Um, it uh, on the surface seems very odd to me. Um, what, tell us about this case and, and what's the, the great story behind it? 
Yeah. Well, it was it was 1980. I I, I really wasn't. I, I was doing primarily violent crime cases for, for police. Uh, both most at that time it was mostly national. Later on, we got some international international cases, and uh, and of course, I heard uh, Larry Flint was shot, but no one associated it with no, uh, with anyone really. Uh, uh, then Vernon Jordan, uh, uh, civil rights leader. Uh, he was he was shot. Uh, there were there were interracial couples being shot around the United States. None of these cases were being put together. Uh, 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 Jewish synagogues were were bombed. Uh, one was bombed early on. Uh, then another one in in uh, Missouri. Uh, there was bar mitzvah, and uh, people were leaving. And uh, Franklin is there, and he, and uh, you know, shoots shoots up the place. Didn't know it was Franklin, you know, at the time. Uh, but but uh, his he was a, a very different kind of case, and and I wasn't sure if I could be of assistance. Although what made it easier is that it wasn't an onset case. So and, and so by the time he was apprehended in Kentucky, he was apprehended in Kentucky. An officer found appeared to be a gun, and it was a gun in, in his car, and they, they brought him in for questioning. Meanwhile, uh, the investigation, they did a real good job, uh, and they, uh, they heard about the arrest out in Utah, and two uh, uh, African-American males were killed out there, and they, and they end up putting things together, and it's Joseph Paul Franklin. Unfortunately, the two cops, uh, two cops are talking. Uh, they leave the room. They leave Franklin for a uh, a minute or so, Franklin uh, climbs out of the window and escapes. He, he escapes. They don't know where he is. They, they try to track him down with a dog. He's sent. He uh, uh, he's a wanted man. He ends up being on the uh, FBI's uh, most wanted top top ten. And then I, I get now it's like October 1980, and I get a call from Dave Cole, uh, who. Is the civil rights desk, and then he asked me if, if if I could be of help in this case. I know what you're doing in, in these other cases, John. This is not a sexual component, but and I says, well, I said I'll give it, I'll give it a whirl. And what do you need? And I said, well, I I need to go through this entire file. So I went up to headquarters. I brought the files, but but I couldn't work there. I wanted to be. I usually work by my, uh, alone. I I want to go and go up on the top floor of the library. The law library, but I'm not a lawyer, but no one would ever be up there. So I'd go up there and I'd spread out the material. So I did a. They didn't know where he was in the in the United States this assessment, but but I could see uh, Franklin was very much like the other violent offenders who, who I've already had researched. He he had a uh, a father who was extremely abusive to him and his uh, three other siblings, but mostly he got the he got the uh, the worst of it. Uh, we investigated. Father was World War II veteran, alcoholic, but would just then he would go off for periods of time, leave the family, abandon them, then come back. The mother was was even more so abusive to to uh, the, uh, the children. Wouldn't let the children associate with anyone. They'd come home from school, they have to sit in front of uh, the television uh, and hardly ate anything. I mean, Franklin would say that he felt he was ten years stunted in uh, in development uh, then as a way of uh, Escaping uh, this, I mean, and this is what you see: is he, he is uh, defenseless. He he's being alienated. He's being isolated. Uh, he, he's questioning his his identity. What what can he do? What can become of somebody? Belong to some group? So that's when he started scouting around. He came up with all the, the Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi Party and uh, various uh, uh, these racist uh, organizations. He would pass out literature. Uh, for these organizations. But then you see, this was in the, in the uh, 60s, 70s, and the FBI, you know, now we were heavily involved in civil rights cases, so we developed informants. So those organizations were were uh, infiltrated by, by informants that the FBI uh, had developed, and, and we pretty much had a good handle on them. And, and Franklin, being paranoid, as he was, not psychotic, just paranoid, not trusting you know, anyone. And he knew that these uh, 
because every once in a while he'd be in arrest that the FBI infiltrated these groups. Plus, the other thing he didn't like was is that these are a bunch of uh, 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 drunks. All they did was they talk, they talked the talk, but they, they wouldn't walk the walk. They weren't uh, g- going out doing the things that they they wanted uh, that they talked about you know doing. So that was going to be really the birth of this this lone wolf type of uh, personality who will start off uh, badgering uh, couples, uh, uh, interracial couples. Uh, first first group was in Maryland where he, he spotted a couple, was surveilling him, surveilling him, following him close. They stopped the car. He stops the car. He goes up and he maces them. And he maces them in, uh, in the car. And then after that, uh, no more mace. After that, it's going to be uh, the use of firearms and the use of uh, bombs. He would make bombs. Uh, he was also a prolific. Uh, he was a bank robber. Uh, he was a bank robber, a good, uh, a good burglar. Uh, and what made it difficult is he was traveling all over. You see, one of the things you try to determine is, is comfort zone. Offenders, are, it's just like us if, and your listeners, it, 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 the same thing. You have a comfort zone, a place where you feel where you can go. It's peace. You feel your this familiarity with that uh, with, with that comfort zone. Well, the problem with the problem with Franklin, he was just so mobile. He was moving, traveling all over the country. He couldn't predict, you know, where he would be going next. So when I did the assessment of, of him, what I saw was his only accomplishment was that he was he did a lot of bank robberies in the Mobile area. He got married twice. He, when he was six, 17, he married a 16-year-old, divorced her after four months. Then when he's 27, he marries another 16-year-old, and they end up having a, a, a child, a, a girl. And uh, looking at that, I, I, my assessment was, they didn't know where he was in the country, Mobile. He's going to Mobile. Also, he's a, he's a big, uh, he, it's kind of unusual. He robbed banks, but to make a few bucks, he would give his blood, get uh, sells plasma for five <laughs> bucks, 10 bucks. And, you know, that was it. Uh, so he would be going to Mobile. And sure enough, uh, initially, the, it goes out, and then we have teletypes. They go out, and, and I get a call from the agent in charge of the Mobile office that they have information now that he is, in fact, in Mobile. He's in Mobile. And he's asking me, what, what bank or savings and loan is he going to be robbing next? I said, what? I said, I said, I, I, I don't know what bank or, uh, you know, it's like asking, like, what's the address of the serial killer? You know, I don't know. I said, I, you didn't even know what city he was in. I told you he was going to be Mobile. Now he got him in Mobile. So, so he was there, but then he took off and he went down to uh, uh, Florida. And by then they had, uh, they, we, we flooded all the, the, the blood donation uh, areas throughout the, the South with flyers and, and descriptions of him, his tattoos, and that's where he was spotted in, inside of a, uh, uh, a blood donor uh, uh, a store. And uh, they did a good job holding him there. The doctor, wait, you know, you got to wait. You can't leave right away. Meanwhile, they're calling the FBI and the FBI goes over and arrest him. And then, so that's how he's apprehended. But then I, I end up uh, providing assistance on how to interview him and, and uh, because now they got to get him back to Utah. Utah wants him for the, a double homicide out there. So uh, I work with the agent on how to interview him. Uh, it's going to be a plane ride back to Utah, and, w- and it was recommended not to go commercial, but to go private. He was, a, he was afraid of, of heights, didn't like flying, uh, you know, at all. And, and, uh, uh, and that's what they did. It took him the long way. But one point I, I, I left off here, too, is sniping. When he was a young child, he lost the sight of his eye in an accident. Uh, some of the stories they are wrong. They say it was a bicycle accident. No, it was it was because of a shade, and it was a spring and a shade. It all went springs uh, in the shades. He was playing with his brother, and the spring popped out, hit him in the eye. Ow. His mother took him to the hospital, and the doctor said that we can't do anything right now, but bring him back in about two months, uh, and we'll. Will make him good as good as good as new again. The mother did not do that. Did not take him back to the hospital. By the time he went to the hospital, it, so much time had elapsed that he was blind. He developed such bad cataracts they couldn't even do any kind of surgery. And so that was one of my assessments of him was that he overcompensated for the loss of his 
eyesight. And here he became this great shot, a sniper. I mean, he could, he, some of his targets, I mean, he was well over 100 yards from the targets when, when he was, uh, you know, shooting victims. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I forgot that. I wanted to include that in, in the, to your listeners and, and the assessment. The the book The Killer Shadow. Uh, this is such a fascinating read, um, and a uh, and you keep us on the edge of our seat the the entire time. Um, John, I don't know how many more of these stories that you have in you that uh, that <laughs> you're gonna keep, more. <laughs> that that you're gonna keep bringing out because every one that you publish is better than the than well, the previous. You. And and uh, I, I I love it. I recommend this book to anyone uh, that loves true crime fiction or. Any writers out there that want to make your uh, your fiction more believable, read John's books. Yeah. That's that's the best training that you could yeah, that's possibly a, that's get. A good point. Yeah, uh, I'm going to put links to the Killer Shadow in the show notes of this episode to make it easy for people to find. Um, John, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the amazing stuff that you're involved with, where can they find you online? They can. Oh, we have a. Uh, well, so we're not we're not keeping up uh, to date though. Mine hundreds ain't that. You know, dot com. But I'm on Facebook, of course, and and uh, you know, and the books are you know, obviously they come out. Uh, uh, you know, we have an Amazon or you know wherever. We're actually working on our next book that'll come out about this time next, you know, next year. Uh, but uh, they should be able to track me down. Well, they can see some interviews that I've done on YouTube, different different interviews. I spoke at Boston College last year with Dr. Ann Burgess, who plays the woman. Uh, nurse in, in uh, my hunter series. Uh, you'll, you'll, they can click on uh, you know, YouTube and, and see some interviews as well. Besides this one, we just did. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, John. Thank you so much for taking thank time you to so come much. on the show. And we're going to send everyone uh, to pick up their copy of the new book, Killer Shadow. And uh, it's it's out available everywhere now. When you're hearing this, uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. On an isolated human planet called Phoenix, outside the Galactic Gate Network, a royal empire teeters on the brink of revolution. The new emperor is weak, the old guard seeks power, and a hidden slave cabal manipulates the great and small houses alike. None of this concerns Simeon Brazhnev, newly appointed steward to one of the most powerful heiresses on the planet. Happy to let the royals play their age-old game of catch the crown, Simeon is more concerned with balancing his mistress's books than worrying about affairs of state. But when Simeon discovers evidence of sedition at the highest levels of government buried deep within her finances, he realizes her great peril. Though a slave, he finds himself trapped in political intrigue, desperate to protect his mistress from the royals who would see her dead and the slave rebels who would make her their pawn. Agonized by the choice of turning her over to the authorities or protecting her secrets, Simeon decides to keep faith with his sovereign over his larger duty, thus flinging himself into a world of power, plot, and assassination. If he fails, they both die, and with them the chance at freedom for Simeon's enslaved race. Set in the Salvage title universe, Salvage Mind is the first of three novels in a new breakout series. Available in ebook format and paperback, Grab your copy today. Salvage Mind by David Allen Jones.